Hello and welcome back to Our Own Canon, a podcast about Asian Americans and our relationship to art. Okay. Yay. So, last We're week back. we did the off topics. Or well, last week. Last for for week. viewers, it will be last week. For us, it's gonna be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for us, it's been several it's been several a weeks. Bit ago. of a minute. Um, part of that, part of that, that that is completely my fault. I've been sick with something for the past couple of weeks and my voice still isn't a hundred percent so if i sound all croaky and weird and if you hear coughing in the background then <laughs> you know who it is <laughs> um but no dude how have you been how's so we're doing an off topic today and i didn't really have anything super planned out but i did like want to ask you how med school is going um just in general, and it's going to feed into the topic a little bit. So, Oh, terrifying. Oh, yeah. It's going to be so much fun. And this is also my um, cop-out to not talk a lot during the episode, is to just ask on personal questions about himself so that I don't have to do anything. Isn't the whole point of this like uh, segment to have you like do the talking and have me do the reacting? <laughs> yes, well, uh, my voice is almost out of commission. I'm barely even here. So just think of this as a very cheap therapy session where you get to talk about all of your problems. <laughs> all of the stuff that you don't like about med school. I'm just kidding. So the the top the off topic for today is the the stereotype of Asians and medicine. Oh and damn, you really threw me for a it. loop, didn't you? I did. <laughs> and okay, so something that I think something that's cool about this topic is that I think both of us are in or have been studying typical Asian things to study. Like I was a pre-law student. I plan on going to law school. You mm -hmm. you were a pre-med student. That's when we met. Um, but, you know, you're also in med school now. I, I, yeah. I'm taking a year off before grad school. You went immediately after you graduated. Um but I feel like your story is still kind of, it's a little bit off kilter. You didn't major in something that was typically pre-med. You have a very interesting philosophy about practicing medicine. So I kind of like want to talk about that and talk about your sort of reflections in this and like why you've made the decision that you've made and why it's... Why well, I think also it's significant because you're one of the only people I know that is Asian and majoring in medicine and doesn't actively just kind of completely hate their lives. I mean, I know that you have like a, I know that you're a little bit stressy, depressy, but it's not anything like existential, you know, but I feel like every time I talk to somebody who's doing pre-med, they kind of talk about it like, Oh, like it's, you know, it's what my parents wanted me to do, you know, and mm -hmm. while that's like somewhat true for you, I feel like it goes much deeper than that. So yeah, I kind of wanted to talk about that and dive into that and it'll give my voice a break and you can kind of talk and it'll be nice. It'll be fun. It's going to be a good time. Um, so I, I don't know if you'll be able to, able to top an off topic again with, with the, at least the surprise factor. <laughs> Because well, I was expecting like a piece of media. I gave you Birdie Wing last time. I was like, "What can she do that will throw me off my game mm -hmm. compared to Birdie Wing?" <laughs> yeah, Birdie Wing was Mission so good though. It was a good. It was a good off topic because it was so random. Mm. This kind of feels very on brand for kind of what we've like originally talked about the podcast being talking about our experiences in reference to um, the sort of. Asian community as a whole and how we feel like we can fit into that and how we feel like we don't fit into that in other ways too and a lot of times we do use media as a reflection for that but at the end of the day too though like our experiences that we live every single day are also part of our own canon you know mm -hmm. and I think it's important to touch on those you know every so often you know we're not going to be self-obsessed or anything but yeah <laughs> maybe 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 a little disclaimer there but no yeah so like how is med school going you're in your first semester how do you how are you liking it so far what have you noticed like give me a brief rundown before we get into the specifics how are you feeling so so far it's like 
it's one of those things where I think like the highs are really high and the and but the like the lows can get like pretty bad too, mm. right? Which is like something I didn't like expect about med school. Well, there's a lot of things I didn't expect about med school because like a lot of people <laughs> that I talk to like going into med school, they'll say things like it's really hard. It's like the 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 big analogy that everyone uses is like mm-hmm. it's like drinking water from a fire hydrant, right? Mm. Um, and like no offense to like med school people but like y'all's metaphors are very limited and that's the only one <laughs> you have told me well why don't I went they... to med school <laughs> that's why they became med majors and not they're not artists <laughs> <laughs> um so i do think the the first uh we don't have semesters we have like blocks right that's weird. Uh, it, 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 it works a little differently is we that do, like... is that a texas tech exclusive thing or is that like I... just how med school works or do you not know I... I suspect it's just how a med school thing works. Okay. Um, because of the way they do it. Because instead of doing like one semester where you take like five courses or something like that, mm-hmm. they do like one ten week block with just one course, right? Oh, interesting. It's very interesting, <laughs> and <laughs> and I think it's the um. I'm sorry. I think it's the thing that be, makes it. You're gonna be dealing with this the whole episode. I'm so sorry. Don't worry about it. I don't Continue. blame being sick. So. <laughs> um, ten week blocks. 10 week blocks they might be a little different depending on which course maybe it's shorter or longer but somewhere mm-hmm. around there um or at least the first block is 10 weeks maybe the next one's going to be like different but i think the thing that's like the first thing that i think is like really different that's a transition between like med school and like undergrad mm-hmm. is that because there there are like only one course at a time it actually mm-hmm. in a lot of ways kind of makes it easier if you're the type of person who just likes to focus on one thing at a time mm-hmm. <laughs> uh instead of are you to that kind with... of person uh yeah it, it, it makes me feel so much better okay that's <laughs> because great. like when it comes to like um undergrad right you're doing like you got a paper for this for this te- uh for this course and then you got to test for this course and you got homework for this and like whatever whatever for that right yeah just being able to just be like there's one test it's coming in three weeks so that's it that's the only thing you have to deal with like mm in some ways does make my life a little easier Mm -hmm. uh like just the lack of distractions is quite nice Mm -hmm. distractions Uh, with like other school yeah distractions with like other like assignments or like the big one that i don't miss at all is Mm -hmm. getting back-to-back tests Mm, yeah (laughs) either several tests in the same week or like tests every every week or something like that that just doesn't happen like it's it's a lot nicer thank god not having to deal with that uh on the other hand though like it is a lot harder. Like, <laughs> I, I don't think the material is particularly difficult, per se. Like, anatomy... Because I'm a fucking le- genius. It's not even that. It's like, <laughs> anatomy just, like, more or less makes sense. Like, things are named in ways that are generally intuitive. There are some, like, muscles or bones that don't make sense by their naming conventions. But a lot of them, they'll tell you where they are, where they go, what they do. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, uh, like... <laughs> the 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 uh the the name of the muscle that flexes the pinky is called flexor digiti mini mes which i love it's, I think it's <laughs> hilarious and adorable but, that but, is really cute <laughs> but it's also really functional because it tells you flexor it flexes and then digiti it's a digit and the mini mes and the pinky mm-hmm. right so like you know like the material fundamentally because of things like that is not going to be straight up difficult compared to like something we're doing like philosophy where you're like trying to understand like Kant's categorical imperative which is like a lot more steps than just listening to the name of the muscle and concepts like bigger concepts (laughs) was that a pun on purpose or not uh, (laughs) you say yes say yes it was on purpose no i think i know i know it's a pun you did on purpose because you'll laugh at your own pun shut up (laughs) stop exposing me I have, like, the same reaction to my jokes that dads have to their jokes. I'm, like, I'm so fucking clever. I'm so <laughs> funny. No, um, I think that's actually fascinating because I, I would agree with you. I think, like, one of the things that is frustrating about studying things like philosophy and literature that don't have mathematical or mm-hmm. let's call them formulaic answers, right? You can't yeah. just plug something into something else and make it work for an essay, right? If Especially mm-hmm. if, like... Your professor is somebody who really likes playing with theoretical stuff. That's just not really something that you can play around with oftentimes because you'll have assignments that are based on 
ideas and you have to infuse these ideas with your own ideas and you have to make them original enough and like plagiarism is also a thing so it's like you have to really kind of think about what would make something original um and i also think there's like a certain degree of that and where it's like philosophy or english also have like a certain standard you set for yourself Mm -hmm. if you're like actually really love it and taking it really seriously like it's hard to Mm -hmm. turn in something that's bare minimum Mm -hmm. and it you know and, and the, that makes it difficult in its very specific, special way. Which I think is wonderful. But I also think that there's something really fascinating about, like, when I think of STEM learning, I think of it as very formulaic. Like, oh, I have to memorize all of these little parts, and then they're going to add up to bigger parts that become the biggest part. So with, like, engineering, right, mm-hmm. it, ultimately it comes down to what kind of machine that you're going to end up making. And so it's like, okay, well, now I have to learn what, like, the tiniest pieces of a machine do, and then I go up from there, and then I go up from there, and then I go up from there, and then I have a whole thing. But then sometimes I look at philosophy and English, and I'm like, it's still kind of the same. <laughs> like, you're still kind of doing the same thing, right? You're starting from fucking letters and shit right like learning how to read and then you go up from there like learning how to form sentences and figuring out what the different components of a sentence is and then 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 you have an idea right like do you find that do you find yourself thinking that like oh this is like very different from philosophy and english but like in many ways it's actually quite similar i don't know like have you ever thought about that when you're like reading a textbook or something well first of all i don't read textbooks anymore oh god damn it <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't read textbooks for years oh seriously <laughs> not for stem at least like for for philosophy we obviously do our reading but for stem i haven't read a textbook in like really ages. you guys don't do Dude. textbook learning that's interesting i didn't know that honestly like the age of the internet's the best time to learn medicine in my opinion because like there are so many great resources th- that online like like so many great like videos and and stuff like that that are like that are just really well made and really succinct and like really help the learning process i mean like i know everyone does it differently but i like step like youtube got me through most of my pre-med and (sighs) it's not as effective now that like this is like graduate level work but like there are there are like resources that we have that are like similar that the med school buys us and stuff like that which i think are like you know like textbooks are like textbooks are great it's like an encyclopedia you want to look something up sure Mm -hmm. but you already know something you just need to verify fine Mm -hmm. but like as the primary source of learning like i haven't touched a textbook in eons that's actually (laughs) incredible i do like that i saw so i have a friend named yasmin who's also in med um Mm -hmm. i think she's still in pre-med right now i don't think she's graduated yet but i was over at her and her roommate's place i hang out more with the roommate than i do with her but like sometimes when i'm over there i watch her study and it was fascinating because she was like looking something up on what looked to me like a text message board and i was like whoa like is that discord and she goes no it's chat gpt huh and she (laughs) was making chat gpt give her an exam and she plugged in so she plugged in a bunch of her notes right like she condensed her notes down into like their own little formulas and then she plugged that into chat gbt and typed in the prompt to be like hey give me a multiple choice test based on these like based on this document and it fucking did interesting that's crazy mm-hmm. i, I did know, not like, like I, I i i don't know like that seems like such a creative way to study but at the same time i was blown away because i was like i've never used a i've never seen ai used like this like i feel like i've been exposed to ai art and like you know more of that side of things where mm-hmm. like things come out and it's more artistic almost which is interesting to think about like ai making art but like i've never seen somebody use chat gpt so functionally like that to actually a, do something with it quite creative potentially very useful use of it honestly <laughs> <laughs> would you ever do something like that <laughs> I would okay. So the main reason I'm going to take practice test is for the explanations. Uh-huh. Not really quizzing yourself is the first thing that it's useful for, and that helps with like recall. But like, really, what I really wanted the explanations. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I don't. 
I don't know if I'm confident in ChatGPT's ability to get good explanations and we already have good ones that the school provides. That's the school provides us with a lot of great resources. So like, so like, I don't know, like, uh -huh. I don't feel like I'm pressed to need to do that, but I can uh -huh. see like in undergrad where like the resources aren't as plenty. Uh, That's also interesting to think really about, useful. right? Cause like the grad mm -hmm. school level is different than what you're doing in undergrad. So like the resources are going to be different. Cause like, I mean, even just thinking about it at the base level, like the allocation of funds for a grad program is going to be very different than for an undergrad program. I don't know. I, for me, I have something like one of the reasons why I'm so fascinated by this and kind of why I wanted to talk to you about it along with, you know, the bigger concept that we'll get to eventually. But I, as somebody who didn't do medicine, right, I have no frame of reference for how any of that stuff really works, except for the fact that it's hard, right? And I think that's <laughs> by virtue of what I've heard a lot of people say that that's like one of the only merits of doing of studying medicine nowadays is that it's just hard it's just difficult like being able to get through a doctorate program and be a doctor and practice medicine is just difficult it's a difficult process it takes a lot of time takes a lot of effort and so like once you get to the end of it it's like yes of course you have like respect and people you know they they look up to that a lot and it's a standard that is supposed to be kind of like upheld and why it's why i think that you know so many asian parents like want their kids to become doctors because it's instant respect instant money you know mm -hmm. or after you become a doctor it's instant respect instant money instant after like four <laughs> yeah. five eight years yeah. like that. <laughs> but it's like it's a way to kind of turn it around in one generation you know Mm -hmm. Um, so I understand like why it's so appealing and why so many parents kind of aspire to that for their kids. Um, so switching gears a little bit into that, I guess, like, do you, like when you were in high school and stuff, was pre-med like what you wanted to do? There are a lot of really complicated feelings about, about my relationship to like medicine pre-med whatnot mm -hmm. and i do want to write more about that in music and whatnot and so i guess this would be the test bed figuring out these ideas mm -hmm. <laughs> precisely <laughs> using art to make more art it's a good idea for real <laughs> <laughs> so i think like in high school i don't i I do think there is a certain part of it in which it's like it's something you want to do like like I do genuinely really believe in medicine I really like it it's something that I'm not only like good at but also something that like I enjoy right and mm -hmm. it, and I really just like the aspect of like interacting with patients and helping people like even mm -hmm. outside of medicine you know I like 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 that the, you know, like that, those yeah. are things that, that I value a lot. So like as a career choice, it does make a lot of sense for me in particular. Mm -hmm. But there also, I can't deny, is also a part of it in which is like growing up, like I don't want to like say it's like the stereotypical way because I do think my parents like eased up on it a lot more than like I've heard some other Asian American kiddos mm -hmm. speaking about their experience with it. Mm -hmm. But I do feel like there is a certain aspect of it, partially from parents, but also partially from society in which it's like, it's kind of the only choice, mm -hmm. right? The mm -hmm. fact that it worked out for me, that it's something that I do excel at and like and believe in is mm -hmm. helpful. But that doesn't really erase the fact that like growing up, it didn't really feel like there were that many options, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't until like late into undergrad then that I really, that the world really opened up for me and like the options became like, it, it made more sense that there were options. But honestly, at that point, like, that was like senior year of like undergrad like that's really late to figure that out mm -hmm. uh so there was there there was like a certain sense of it like going from high school to like undergrad for a long part of it where it's like yeah like i don't know what else i would have done if i didn't do this mm -hmm. <laughs> right like what are the options it's like medicine law i can't be a lawyer trust me <laughs> <laughs> the fact that you can is is, is a superpower that i do not have <laughs> Trust me, I, I can barely do it, too. It's fine. <laughs> um, but I do get what you mean about feeling like feeling like it's the only option. Because mm -hmm. 
And I think that's why, and we've talked about this so often, right? But that's why representation is so vital. And this is something that Hassan Minhaj talks about in his uh, comedy special on Netflix called Homecoming King. He's like, because of the represent, like of Eurocentric representation in most forms of media, like when you want to do something as a white person, even just by virtue of like, you know, even if you are skilled, right, you know, whatever, you just get asked less questions along the way is how he Mm -hmm. phrased it, right? He's like, you just, people just don't, like, if you're a white guy and you're in a band, people are like, yeah, of course. If you're a white guy and you want to become a librarian, people are like, yeah, of course. You're a white guy, you want to become a doctor. Yeah, of course. You're a white guy, you want to be a president. Yeah, of course. If you're an Asian kid and you want to do music, that's like, it's considered so interesting and people are like, they have so many questions and they're like, mm-hmm. whoa, like how, how do your parents feel about that? And it's like, why does that matter? Like, <laughs> would you ask anybody else that question if, if I didn't look the way that I did, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And I think no, by I... virtue of that being like the thing that people ask questions about, it's like, yeah, no, we don't have as many options because people don't see us in these ways they see us in very particular ways and then it translates into the way that they perceive all of us and what choices that we have and subsequently it affects the way that we view ourselves because it's like well everybody else thinks these are the only options for me that means those are actually the only options you know Mm -hmm. um and yeah like so for so when you first i guess realized that you did have other options Right. Um, Did that strike? I mean, I'm sure there was like a balance of sadness and excitedness, but which one were you more like, what do you associate more with that situation? Do you associate it more with like, oh, that's like kind of sad that like I didn't realize that I had all of these other options like until now? Or were you like, fuck, I have so many options that I didn't realize until now, you know, like which one I guess is more accurate to the way that you were feeling? I made a whole album. To yeah. talk about that. <laughs> You've listened to it. I, uh, I did. Um, I think I think it's like, a, it's 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 a lot of both. Honestly, like like mm-hmm. the, the sadness definitely. Um, something that like I thought about a lot when um when making when making the album mm-hmm. that it didn't really make it into the uh, into any of the songs in the way I wish it would have. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, but the, the, um, the, the, the starts a bit are there and I'll probably revisit the idea, right? Is that like mm-hmm. the line between my life and the options that I have, or at least I felt I had at up to that point in my life to colonialism would like became like really clear, really, <laughs> really abundantly clear throughout, throughout the process of like figuring all that out. Right. Mm-hmm. It's because like as you were kind of like talking about earlier like like white people in america don't get questioned when like they want to do things and that's the same as like asian people in like asia right mm-hmm. like you know like it's it's really interesting watching anime sometimes because like you know that they're asian people mm-hmm. um and especially like something like like fruits basket where they have like that one like episode where like they're talking it's like cr- family career day like they bring their families and they talk about their future plans and whatnot it's really interesting to see these like asian characters throw ideas that aren't uh particularly what you expect from asian people at least in america Mm -hmm. right um and like i was writing and like it kind of all started clicking together it's like that was something that kind of was stolen from us (laughs) Mm -hmm. right the ability to truly dream Mm -hmm. right was stolen from us right direct links between colonialism to now Mm -hmm. right that was stolen from us and like that when 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 i figured that out like that that made me sad also made me very angry (laughs) that made me sad i hope so (laughs) right because like like i you know i talked about one of the songs like the french left vietnam like when my grandma was still alive like Mm -hmm. my grandma saw the french leave vietnam and then the Vietnam War happened, right? And mm-hmm. <laughs> mm. that might have been a little bit of American colonialism. Let's be honest. We here. <laughs> have we have thoughts about the Vietnam War, <laughs> right? Um, we which have directly, many thoughts. <laughs> yeah, and that directly led to like my parents being refugees, and like growing up in America is very different than growing up in Asia, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of like the societal like 
see see like i think a lot of the discourse about asian americans and their relationship to like medicine and like law and stuff like that are really focused around like tiger moms mm -hmm. right and parents and things like that and like i do think to a certain degree that's true but let's take one step back and ask them why do they act like that they act like that because they've been put in situations in which like th like they put in, put into survival situations in which they have to think about things like that right in which like the only way that they can see upward mobility for the coming generations is through these these paths right mm -hmm. not being put in those situations i'm pretty sure they would loosen up a lot more so the mm -hmm. question is why are they in these situations right mm -hmm. the answer is colonialism <laughs> at least at least yeah. at least to how i see it right um and we are talking about we're talking about colonialism obviously in the sense of like how it happened historically but colonialism happens all the time nowadays too right yeah. eurocentrism in and of itself is a type of like micro colonialism that we don't really talk about but we're exposed to all the fucking time i mean i don't know like i think it's so i lived in korea for six months and i didn't see a single other like white person other than when we were you know inside the dorms and we were you know hanging out but the people of it is when interesting you were too, white though. people land in korea right but like the people <laughs> that i hung out with there were also all minorities which was very interesting like the group of people that i chose to hang out with was like this tight really tight-knit group of kids who knew what it was like to be asian american hispanic american right uh like even european like american is an interesting thing to think about like mm -hmm. having lived in america for a couple of years after having lived in europe for your whole life like that is a kind of migration that we don't often talk about i mean it's still he's still white but like y you know what i mean right like a group <laughs> yeah. of people that is used to being out of their comfort zones um and you know there's nothing wrong with the fact that i hung out with you know not white people but i do think it's interesting that like I basically spent six months not seeing a single white person and like my entire outlook on life changed when I was in Korea because I was exposed to people who weren't, who looked like me, talked like me, you know, had the same parents that I did, you know, grew up where I was born, right, and had such different aspirations and such different outlooks on life than I did because I had spent so much time in America just trying to figure out how to like fucking fit in that I didn't realize there were like, you know, other possibilities mm -hmm. out there to do other things. But it's so true. Like the way that we are conditioned, specifically in like American schools, the American public education system is such an interesting dynamic of like violent socialization. Like being in public school in America, you are socialized so particularly. Mm -hmm. And I think that like, one of the big reasons why I think that, I mean, like, bullying is such an Asian American kid, like, staple, you know? I mean, the yeah. micro the microaggressions every yeah. fucking day, like, let me make fun of your name, like, where do you come, like, where do you come from? What is that that you're eating? Like, we deal with it all the fucking time, and it definitely affects the way that we view ourselves, and, like... I have to remember also that like for a lot of us that came here also like when our parents were on the younger side like they moved here when we were babies like our parents experienced bullying too in different ways like in adult ways but like they they mm -hmm. experienced it too and so part of the reason why and exactly what you were saying right part of the reason why that they're so hard on us and they have such particular ways of viewing the world is because they've had i mean just awful experiences yeah. you know Very particular awful experiences and probably a lot of like things that they're still processing themselves right mm -hmm. like i don't imagine you come here as a refugee you're mentally all you got that figured out <laughs> do you i guess you like and i can answer this too i guess but like do you think your parents acclimated well to america or do you think there's just still a little bit because you know those like you know those parents that like come to america and then you're like oh like you bought into the american dream for sure and like it actually makes you happy you know um like okay you have you have the house in suburbia and your kid goes to university and like you know you go to church every Sunday, right? Like, and they're happy in that. And you can kind of tell that they always like 
fit in or a little bit in that or they find like genuine joy and bliss in it because they genuinely think like this is the success um for my mom I never really looked at her that way and I never got that impression from her because for me my mom came here early in life but also later in life like she went to college in America so like in many ways she was socially conditioned in Asia but she had like in some of her most formative years she was in America Right. Mm. So a lot of times I look at my mom and I'm like, oh, you're an American. But sometimes I look at other people's parents and I'm like, no, you're still Korean. (laughs) And like, I don't know. Do your parents feel American or do they feel Vietnamese to you? I think they might protest, but I do think they feel American. (laughs) Really? Interesting. Uh, Yeah. Well, my mom and dad came here like one of them was 10, one of them was 13 when they came here. Right. So like 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 your mom, they had like a lot of formative years here. Right. Mm -hmm. And I also think, like, the American dream, like, kind of did pay off for them in in a lot of ways. Uh Uh-huh. Right. Because, like, they they came from, like, like, war-torn. Like, my dad grew up. My dad was born in the middle of the war. Right. So, like, when you go from, like, literal poverty to, like, having anything. Mm -hmm. Right. It's going to inherently feel like it worked out for you. Mm -hmm. Right. Despite all the fact that there is inherently going to be an upper limit to i think what they can accomplish mm-hmm. right um what minorities can accomplish in general there is going to probably be an upper limit to it i just feel like their jump from it from from literal property to where they are now like it feels relatively really large so they they genuinely feel like it's all paid off i mean i i do think that they do understand that there are like certain things and like they do have certain reservations, but I think in general, they seem to have a pretty positive outlook on it. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas like me growing up like American, like, 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 like born in America and growing up with these ideas that, that feel a lot like wider. Right. Because like, you know, when people talk about like their dreams and stuff in America, all, all that rhetoric is pointed towards like, honestly like white people who like can actually like have the la- the 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 wide scope to be able to achieve all those things yes. but you as like in a minority you absorb that anyways right so you start to think like wait, wait, wait i that those those are things that i can do and then you very quickly learn that you can't right yeah or, or that your options have suddenly become really limited even though you've grown up with this like american dream rhetoric that says that you can do all this right mm-hmm. and then you hit that wall <laughs> yeah right um so i think I don't think anything's changed between my parents and my generation. It's just the fact that like the way that we've like been socialized and conditioned growing up, they got to see a lot more upward mobility than like I get to. Right. So in comparison, like, I think that's what gives me like a, a more pessimistic outlook on it than like my parents would. Mm. I don't know if I explained that well and I probably no. could do it a little better, but I think I got most of the ideas. There. No, I get it. <laughs> I get it. I also think exposure is important. I think, mm-hmm. I think the way that America was marketed to a lot of our parents is still the way that they look at America. And even mm. though they experience microaggressions and racism and bad things that happen when you are a person of color in this fucking country, right? Like, it, the list goes on and fucking on, right? Like, any of the number of things that you've experienced living here, not looking like the norm, right? Right. Um, For whatever reason, it's like our parents pay, they just kind of like pay it up, you know, Mm -hmm. they're like, well, you know, I'm here and, you know, everything else is like somewhat fine. So it's like, I'm not really going to complain about this because it's just really not my problem. Like it doesn't bother me. But for people like us, right, who more grew up here, who have different, obviously, outlooks on like the way that social, you know, The way that we should be respected as human beings just by virtue of existing is very, very different, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so I guess bringing this a little bit back closer into like what we were talking about before with like, you know, medicine and doctor and, you know, I guess in your experience for what you want to do with your, you know, doctorate later in life, how do you think your 
your vision of being a doctor compares to the vision that your parents have of you being a doctor? Because I feel like there's two different kinds, right? Like sometimes, sometimes I look at people and I'm like, no, you just want, like, you just want your, doc- like, you just want your kid to be a doctor, not because you want them to help people, but because you want them to like make money, right? And like, obviously mm-hmm. there's going to be a little bit of that in like, everything like your parents want you to be successful right they don't want you to struggle over having to pay for shit you know so like you know with my mom like she of of course like she loves the fact that I want to be a lawyer because it's academic and because it's you know all this good stuff but also she's like she's not upset by the fact that it's a it's an occupation that will make good money for me right um (laughs) but like for you I guess how does that image of it kind of differ from how you envision yourself being a doctor and occupying that space and occupying that job and having that degree under your belt like how do you see that in your future and how do you think it compares and contrasts to the way that your parents envisioned that future for you it's a very interesting and nuanced question i know Uh, i'm very (laughs) good at this (laughs) i think part of so if you like I, I I don't know how it is with other like Asian American kids parents, but I do think that there is a certain degree of it for my parents in which they do genuinely like the idea that like I get to like help people in it. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh at least like 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 my mom my mom in particular is really big on like helping people where you can. She's like of the uh of the she has a, she has a very strong religious persuasion right mm-hmm. that that if god gives you talents then you then you have uh I, I say moral obligation but i don't think it's as strong as a moral obligation as much as just like a a a a passion and like it is partially obligation but also partially just like trajectory i guess mm-hmm. speaking of spiritual things is difficult uh, <laughs> but 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 my mom is very Fair much enough. of that of that like religious like philosophy right so Mm -hmm. i so there is a certain aspect of it which is deeply rooted in the fact that she thinks that like this is genuinely just something that's like you like like you can do it you should do it it'll probably make you happy that type of stuff like helping people is just a net good that you should do because you can Mm -hmm. right and i think that's part of the reason that's part of her vision of me as as a doctor Mm -hmm. uh i do also think and kind of understand that there's a part of it that's rooted as a direct response from my parents experiences living in for, for my dad, it was, it was during the war and my mom was right after the war. Mm-hmm. Right. In that, like they genuinely lived an experience in which they did not have financial stability. Right. Mm-hmm. It's very hard to know where, like where like your next meal is coming from and, and things like that. Um, so I do think there is an aspect of it too. That's not really about making good money as much as it's about making really stable money, mm-hmm. right? Having because a stable like, career, yeah. Mm-hmm. Because medicine is an industry for a whole host of reasons that are, that's, that's honestly a different topic. is 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 a very it's a very stable career, mm-hmm. right? And I think that's like one of the things that they find so appealing about like 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 medicine in particular, but also like on the side like law and things like that too, right? Wh- mm-hmm. Which are like kind of careers that like. If you're invested in the status quo, almost always are are going are going to pay well, or are, are almost always going to be like foundational bedrocks of like the country. Yes, right? uh, you're never um, going to be out of a job because people yeah, are always never... going to get hurt and people are always going to be in trouble with the law. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think that's like, and and I think if you compare that to like my idea of like what medicine is, it's like mm-hmm. similar but also like different Mm -hmm. right i i I do still like i i the altruistic aspect of it is really important to me i don't particularly follow the exact same philosophy as my mother about like that but like but i do think that's like a particular value of it Mm -hmm. right um the 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 altruistic aspect for me is a little different i just like maybe we can talk about that later but no um, yeah we can talk about it later (laughs) and the the financial aspect i find a little different because like in order to think that medicine is a good stable career you have to buy into the status quo a bit and you have to kind of be invested in things not changing Mm -hmm. right 
um, for several reasons. Partially because for one is because like medicine is such a long term time investment. If mm-hmm. you are invested in the status quo changing, spending sixteen years of your life studying this thing is a really bad idea. If mm-hmm. things might change later, right? Yeah. Um, and me as a person who has a lot less investment in status quo, partially because of the people that I grew up with and partially because of my like uh, education and philosophy, mm-hmm. right? Have to kind of let go of the idea that like medicine is like, if I get my way, medicine is probably not going to be as stable as it is because like universal healthcare is the way to go, but that's actually just going to hurt doctors, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> right. So like, it's it's a complicated dissonance for me understanding the fact that like medicine is a very like high paying stable job and building a lot of my future ideas about what i want to do off of that Mm -hmm. while also having to also make sure that i don't get too lost in that because genuinely i genuinely believe with all my heart and i know a lot of my colleagues may disagree with me that like universal like healthcare is the way to go Mm -hmm. right um and i don't i don't (laughs) i don't know where that resolves (laughs) but you don't have to know that now though yeah <laughs> but i i think that's like a very it, it's it's a difference in between the way that like my parents look at it right because like mm-hmm. given that we do like accomplish on the universal healthcare like medicine probably will be a lot less stable and like it will probably be a different vision than what like my parents want from it mm-hmm. right uh yeah so i guess that's a long way around your answer <laughs> i kind of love that though i i don't know i think being able to pick your brain on stuff like this is so vital to me just as a person because (laughs) you and i had very different upbringings i feel like Mm -hmm. our parents are very different people so it's like we share so much of what i believe is like the quintessential you know this is what growing up asian feels like like we've talked so much about that and we have so much in common with stuff like that but so one thing that i find really fascinating is my mom never really pushed me to be a doctor Mm -hmm. Um, which is why I find that stereotype so intriguing because it's like, for me, I don't really think it's a bad thing, but like, apparently it's something that's worthy of mockery. Like, I remember the first time somebody made fun of me for that. Like I, they were like, oh, so like, is your mom a tiger mom? And I was like, I mean, like kinda. And they were like, well, like, what does she want you to study? She wants you to study medicine, right? She wants you to become a doctor. And I was like realizing that he was making fun of me. And I was like, why are you making fun of me for that? Like, why is that something that's worthy of ridicule? And I guess it has, I don't know, I guess it has something to do with the fact that like tiger parents are lame and they don't want you to have fun. But also at the same time, like all of that is rooted in like your parents just want you to be successful. Like they want you to be stable. They want you to have a good life in general. And like, I think that applies to most people's parents. What I think is fascinating, though, is the way that it sometimes tra- like that how that behavior translates into the way that they treat their kids and their futures, right? Mm-hmm. Because they want the future to be so certain, and they want their children to be on such a specific path because they think that path guarantees success. That they like forget that happiness is like also a key function of human like existence, and so. <laughs> Like, they'll push their kids to the point where they're just fucking miserable, right? They they hate what they're doing. They don't want to be here. They're, but it's like, oh, fuck. Like, my parents are paying for school and I have to be here because this is what's been expected of me my entire life. And, like, I think it's possible to find genuine happiness in that and do it the way that you're doing it, right? Where you were like, well, this is something that I'm gifted in. This is something that's going to, like, allow me to help people. And so, like, yeah, of course, you know? Like, was I pressured into this? I wasn't pressured into it per se. I guess like, I don't know. Do you feel like, do you feel like you were pressured into doing this or do you feel like it was like, you know, this is an option for me and I guess I'm good at it. So like, yeah, sure. Like I'll take this path. I don't think I felt like fresh. I I do know that there are some kiddos who genuinely do feel like they were pushed, pushed into it. Yeah. So I don't want to discount that. But for my particular experience, I don't feel like I was pressured into it as much as all the other options were kind of just non-options, mm-hmm. right? Because, like, like the way that it happened a lot with me was that, like, you would say, I want to be a doctor, right? And they'd be like, great, here's all the great things about it. You would say, I want to I want to do something else. I want to be a musician, right? Uh-huh. And then the conversation always turns into, well, think about these problems involved in this career, mm-hmm. right? And and the, the thing that's being omitted here is the problems with being in medicine, right mm-hmm. Gen- med school is very difficult but like that never 
that never comes up. It, it's always a thing that you know, mm -hmm. right? That medicine's going to be difficult, but isn't anything difficult, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's somewhere where like the dissonance between our parents, especially the ones who aren't in medicine, are kind of like aiming the trajectory, right? Kind of don't mm. understand is that like, and yeah. I think this is where a lot of Asian American kiddos get in a lot of trouble. Yes, right. Is the fact that like the 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 genuine difficulty of it is downplayed so much and then you get there right mm -hmm. several things happen one it's just really hard two mm -hmm. if you don't like it mm -hmm. that's a that's a miserable ex existence like, mm -hmm. like 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 i cannot imagine hating something so much and spending so much of your life with it mm -hmm. right that, that 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 genuinely is a miserable existence and there's also the fact that like social stereotypes play in right like i talked about it in I've talked about it before, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. It's the idea, it's the catch-22 of, like, either, either, like, do good at medicine and then have no options, right? Or, or don't do good at it, and now you're, like, a defective Asian, right? Like, mm -hmm. like, 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 there's a certain social stigma of, like, being an Asian that's not in, in, in one of these, like, careers, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's, like, the thing that doesn't really get brought up when, at least, at least for how my parents approached it, about why I, I don't feel like they pushed me into it as much as I just felt like there just didn't feel like there were many viable options because anytime you would bring up any other options, it would be like a list of like concerns to have. And I think they're, they're genuine concerns, mm -hmm. right? So when you do the, 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 the pros and cons list, you mm -hmm. have medicine, which is all these pros and no cons because no one's talking about them, mm -hmm. right? And then you have everything else, which is all the cons and there yeah. are pros, but yeah. it also has like all the cons. You look at that list, it's a very obvious choice about what to do. Right. right? Um, it's almost like I a know, process of elimination thing. It's like, it's like this necessarily isn't necessarily the right answer, but it's it's something that, you know, by process of elimination, it's like the only path that you can take. It becomes the only answer. Yeah. Right. Um. And and I I, I think, I I I do think that there are definitely Asian Americans who are pushed into it. But I think, if I'm gonna take a more nuanced approach, I think that's more of how it happens than just straight up being pushed into it. That's fair. Right. Because yeah. I I do try to give I think our Asian American parents more benefit of the doubt than I think is generally in the asian american discourse like i feel like when it I comes agree. to asian americans a lot of them are talking about like tiger moms and things like that i'm much more fascinated on like what's pushing people to become tiger moms like why are they like this like what what are the actual mechanics is it really true that they're pushing the kids or is it something more like what i just discussed here yeah right um and i think that's probably a more nuanced and i think more interesting and i think it more better identifies the problem being you know, I keep talking about it, I keep coming back to it, mm -hmm. identify the problem being colonialism rather than, like, just our parents being awful. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think they're being awful. I think that there's very specific situations and circumstances that are, like, leading us into this place. And I think uncovering that is going to do a lot of benefit for the community in general. Mm -hmm. I think you were absolutely right with all of those points. Um, there's definitely something that is... It weighs on my heart a lot when people talk about the way that their parents treat their career choices. Um, mm -hmm. Not just in the Asian community, but just overall. Because I feel like when you're this age, right, and you have the whole world in front of you, it kind of reminds me of something that I think Bo Burnham said in an interview where I think the interviewer was talking to him about how like kids these days are just like up all night because they are like glued to their electronics, you know, like you go into a kid's room and they're just like up, you know, and Bo Burnham is like, well, like fucking yeah, because the infinitesimal like universe or darkness and yourself, like... <laughs> That oh, makes, like, that makes sense, you know? And so when you were talking about how, like, when you're presented with these choices, it's like one is made to be the obvious choice and the other one is made to be, like, you know, something that's just not really favorable. It reminds me of that, but in, like, the opposite way, right? Where, like, mm -hmm. you're getting pushed into this, like, one specific thing versus, like, the this wide array of other options that you could choose. Um... And, like, of course, having empathy for our parents is good. And, like, it is more productive to 
have conversations about where that behavior actually comes from and what it's rooted in and those psychological processes that are behind it instead of just writing it off as like, oh, our parents were like horrible people, you know? Because they were also figuring shit out when they got here, you know? And when they were growing up, they grew up with us, you know, in foreign places where they, in a foreign place where they didn't really know, you know, everything that was going on and they were just trying to like make it. And in a, a lot of ways, interestingly enough, it's hard for us to empathize with our parents about stuff like that because we have never been put in that position because they, the life that they fought for is one that we get to enjoy mm -hmm. just by virtue of having been here for longer, you know, or like for more of our lives than they have. Um, and so it's just this really interesting kind of like Ouroboros that happens where it's like, Asian kids wonder why their their parents can't empathize with them and Asian parents wonder why their kids can't empathize with them and it just mm -hmm. I mean I think there is a point where you sometimes break even um I think my mom and I got there a couple of years ago when we had this really long conversation about how like I just want to live and experience stuff and I don't really care. I mean, I care about my future, but I don't care about my future the way a parent cares about their kid's future. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in the way that in the way that it's like my mom lived for me. She lived, breathed, ate for me for 18 years and then all of a sudden I was supposed to be my own person that like did my own thing and had to figure all my own shit out my mom's like no no my my idiot child who used to eat their own <laughs> shit does not know what is good for them does not know what is right I mean and I get that right like you spend years years making decisions for this like being that doesn't know anything about the world and then all of a sudden they're supposed to start making their own decisions and it's just such whiplash i feel like and i think that makes sense like i think it's genuinely cognitive dissonance for a parent when their children start to have free will it doesn't it's not like a bad thing right it's just mm -hmm. i bet it's jarring because yeah. you take care of this like fucking blob of flesh that does not know how to feed itself <laughs> that doesn't know how to shit on its own right and then all of a sudden they're like deciding things about what they want to do with their lives and it's like no of course you can't make these decisions like of course that doesn't make any sense you know and i get like i get it i completely understand where that comes from but like as a child as well it's like that shit is suffocating because it's like no yes i am a human being like yes i've grown up and like yes i know things about the world because i have been here for 21 years and now i know things and now i know things that you don't know because i think that's also another concept that like parents find it difficult to understand is that their parents know things that they don't or like that you know <laughs> things that they don't right mm -hmm. like university is very different than it, like than when it was when our parents yeah. were in college and like social interaction is very different than when our parents were kids and the idea of a community is very different the idea of artistic expression is very different the internet has literally changed the fucking world the world is entirely different right from when our parents were kids and they find it hard to wrap their heads around that and understand that like in some ways their kids do know more about the world than they do by virtue of just being young people who exist in it and that's hard like that's all an adjustment that our parents have to do and I can understand why it's so like weird but I don't know like I guess okay so for me all of that stuff right all of the stuff that I just talked about right like my mom's inability sometimes to understand the fact that I am an autonomous human being now that can make her own decisions and like do her own things right like <laughs> sometimes when my mom doesn't get that it's very frustrating to me because I'm just like dude like I understand what like where all this is coming from but like fucking give me a break like I'm trying to figure shit out too like I know I know that you're trying to figure things out and change is hard but like I'm doing the same thing so like let's talk about it and have a discussion about it and fucking work through it and actually hear each other instead of just like writing me off because 
you're de facto right because you're my parent, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that is where a lot of Asian parents do get it wrong. And like what you were saying with like, I want to give Asian parents the benefit of the doubt. I absolutely agree with you. But there is one thing that always just frustrates me because I'm like, talk to your kids. Talk to them. Like have a fucking conversation with them. Talk to them like they're normal human beings. And that's something that I just haven't really ever seen. Like, I didn't see that growing up, and I still don't see it now. All of my Asian peers, they don't talk to their parents. They don't tell their parents <laughs> shit. They don't. They don't. They don't. They don't tell their parents anything. They don't tell their parents where they're going. They don't tell their parents who they're friends with. They don't tell their parents their routines because it's like, stay the fuck out of my life because you don't really acknowledge the stuff that I'm doing as living yet. So I'm just going to do my own thing and, like, wait for you to catch up. Mm -hmm. That's what I've kind of found that Asian kids tend to do when they're like having this kind of, I don't, I don't want to say conflict, but it's like, that's the natural course of things. If you don't talk to your children is they just kind of like slowly drift away. Cause it's like, I'm not gonna, cause again, like from the time that we're about teenagers, right? Like 15, 16. And we're like, dude listen to me like this is how the world is now and this is how i'm trying to operate in it and this is how it is and like i'm sorry that you don't understand that but like this is genuinely what i'm going through and i'm trying my best to explain it to you you do that enough times and then it just just tr kind of starts to feel like counterintuitive because it's like why am i trying to explain what i'm feeling to a person who already assumes that they know what i'm thinking mm -hmm. right so I don't know. I see I see a lot of my friends just going about their life and their parents just aren't a part of it at all. Or when they are a part of it, it's like this completely artificial version of themselves that they have specifically curated just to like keep their parents happy. It's like, oh yeah, no, like of course I'm like in pre-med and I'm getting good grades and I'm doing all of this stuff, but I'm definitely not going to tell you that I went to parties Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday before I came to church, right? Like they're not going <laughs> to talk about that stuff, right? Um, and so I think that's where I find just a lot of, like, that's where I find the biggest conflict is, like, talk to your kids, you know, or just, like, try, just try communicating with them, like, they're fucking people, but, yeah, no, I don't know, like, do you, do you have conversations with your parents like that, where they, where you're talking about something that you're going through, and it's like, yes, I am a human that is dealing with this. And your parents are like, you are a human that is dealing with this. And they talk to you about it. Like you're actually going through it. Or do they just kind of like brush it off as like, eh, well, you know, whatever. Like he'll grow out of it eventually. I think I genuinely have like a pretty good relationship with like my parents. <laughs> Probably, I, I talk to my mom a lot actually. And I think part of like the reason is that like, I, I think part of the reason why I had a lot of a hard time talking to her at certain points earlier in my life is that like we kind of just saw the world really different mm -hmm. um like i don't know you know you you know my background i'll explain it to everyone else but like i grew up in like i grew up in a high school that was like really queer mm -hmm. right so like i was brought up on a lot of that like social justice shit right <laughs> that uh, social justice shit <laughs> And then I went to college and I studied philosophy, right? And, like, I know our school does a lot of analytical philosophy and whatnot, mm -hmm. but I do try to keep genuinely in touch with a lot of, like, social movement philosophy, civil rights, workers' movements, things like that. So I see the world fundamentally very different than my parents do. And I think that was a really big source of tension when trying to, like, have conversations with them because, like, you know, you're just, like, screaming into, like, you're just, like, trying to explain to them, like, the world is this certain way and it's awful in this and it's scary. Please, someone t affirm to me that it is scary like that. Yes. Right? Or at least that's what I wanted a lot from my parents. Mm -hmm. Right? Just just to like, just be like, hey, like, this like life is really hard mm -hmm. and it's scary mm -hmm. and it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Please just, I don't even need you to fix it. I just need you to accept that it is. Mm -hmm. Right? And accept and, that I'm feeling this way. Uh-huh. And a lot of the frustration was them bouncing off that. Just being like, you should feel lucky. Right? Yes. We, 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 have, we have done so much. We provided so much. Yes. Right? All those things. The uh, medicine's actually not that hard. Just, just suck it up and deal with it. You know, things like that. Yeah. Um, and then uh, 2020 happened. And I think something really interesting happened that I think was a really big breakthrough for, like, my relationship with my mom in particular is that, like, 
my mom was really receptive during the the George Floyd thing to listen to to both me and my brother, mm-hmm. right? We we grew up around like where people minorities we, we, we like like we having these conversations about why these things happen and the nature of how the world functions and her getting to see an example of that happening mm-hmm. it's irrefutable, mm-hmm. right? If I'm talking about like things like this before. It's just how I see the world versus how she sees the world. But now there's this whole thing, mm-hmm. right? And she also has like, she also has like a lot of like minority friends, and like African American friends and things like that. So her between her talking to them and us, and she started to realize, wait, we do know something about the world. Mm-hmm. My mom has told me this several times. <laughs> where it's like, I, I've actually learned a lot about you guys. Uh, I've learned a lot from you guys about like how the world works, right? And, and she may not agree with everything, but I do think that, like, was a really big breakthrough moment and really opened up a little bit more of a shared world view, mm-hmm. right? Now, when I say the world sucks, she might not always agree with it, but she can see some reasons in which I would, like, move in that direction, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like, you know, like... She sees the validity in that statement, she sees even the if she doesn't it. feel it. Yeah. Yeah. Because, like, it was hard to go through, I think, that and really engage with it and not come out with a little bit more understanding with it. And I know some people shut their brains off and don't want to engage with this, this, uh, what they call it in the media, like racial reckoning. <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, I feel like that term is so, so weird. No, but you're right uh, though. So many people just mm-hmm. like did not, they weren't, they did not understand what was going on. And I was just like, mm-hmm. dude, it's literally plain as fucking day. I do not understand. Really? Really? You don't <laughs> understand this? Like, Oh my god! But also, on the other hand, I think authentically engaging with it, it's hard to come out and not at least have somewhat of an understanding. And I, I, I don't think, at least, I, I don't think everyone who has engaged with it completely has bought into all the things that actually need to be done. Yes. In order to fix this problem, but true. there is a little bit more of an understanding, and that may not be enough to change the world in ways that needs to be changed in order to solve this problem. But that was enough change, I think, in order to have a conversation, to to have a little bit more of a shared worldview with my mom that, like, makes these conversations a little easier to have. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, gosh. I feel like... That was a lot. (laughs) No, no, you're right. You're... But, like, everything that you're saying is clicking for me, and I think that makes a lot of sense. With my mom, though, I guess... I guess something that was different with my relationship with my mom was that, we, like, we did talk about a lot of stuff. Like, that thing that Asian kids do where they don't really talk to their parents, my mom and I never really did that. I mean, obviously, when I was a kid, like, I hid stuff from her because I was just like, this is weird. Like, I don't want my mom to know about this, <laughs> right? But, like, as I got older, I found myself being like, well, you were 21, right? And now you're not anymore. So, like... What were you doing when you were 21? (laughs) Like, tell me. But, like, I'm so serious, right? Because I think it's it's so fascinating to me. Like, and and this is something that actually happened, right? So, like, in the 80s with the big hippie movement and everything, right? There was a bunch of young people who were just like, well, like, fuck the man, right? Like, the man fucking sucks. Like, fuck the government. They're sending off all of our, like, young people to war. Like, fuck all of this shit like we're fucking out and then like there was this big old wave of like do whatever the fuck you want like love everybody blah blah blah. and those same fucking people became republicans later in life (laughs) and are now denying rights to the same people that they used to fight for when they were kids Mm -hmm. and like sometimes i see my mom doing that shit Because, like, the loan, so the program that my mom used to, like, come into this country, the visa that she had, doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And my mom thinks it's, like, very easy to get into this country because she, that that was her experience with it, right? Like, she came here for college and just, like, stayed, right? Because that was, like, a thing that you used to be able to do. And now, like, you can't really do that anymore. And she doesn't understand that. And so, like... Whenever I talk about immigration and I talk about how, like, we need to be letting people into this country because they are escaping things that we have never even thought about. Like, we need to be letting war refugees into this country. We need to be letting people who are, like, victims of gang violence from Mexico come into this fucking country. Like, that's important because people's lives are important. And, like, my mom will do the fucking thing where she's like, well, like, I mean, they could do it the right way. And I'm like, no! No! Stop it! No, that's not a thing. Because 
it's it's just hard for them to wrap their heads around the fact that like they they are they have had experiences now right that are considered privileged because they look at our lives and they're like your life is so much more privileged compared to my life but then they find it hard to look back at where they came from and be like oh fuck there's like a ton of other people that are in the same position that i used to be in and now i just don't have empathy for them anymore because my standard of living is different and it's so frustrating to me not that I'm saying that my mom was a Mexican refugee, but like, <laughs> yeah, dude. but like when you're Hispanic, <laughs> surprise, no, but like, it's so. Well, we're gonna have to change the intro to this podcast. Oh no, <laughs> no, the entire premise of the show has to change. But you know what I mean, right? Like, where someone goes through something, and then they look at other people who are going through the same thing, or are having somewhat of a similar experience and they just like lack empathy for it because the way that they experienced that thing is different. Like my mom is an immigrant in this country, but her immigration experience is not the immigration experience. So when I try to explain immigration experiences to her, she already has an idea in her head of what it's like. Mm -hmm. And so trying to explain it in a different way is like, it's just impossible sometimes and sometimes mm. it genuinely feels like that um but other times i'll have like genuine conversations with her about how like she used to do cocaine in college and i'm just like wow yeah, like how did your mom i'm like maybe my mom is a human actually like maybe my mom was a human being <laughs> Damn. but i don't know i i think in many ways The Asian American experience is such a rich, I mean, we all experienced it differently, but somehow we all came out of it the same. You know, like Even your relationship with your parents is very different than my relationship with my mom and like my dad, right? But like, we also get what, like, you get what I'm saying when I talk about stuff mm -hmm. like this. And I get what you're saying when you talk about stuff with your parents. And, like, the pressures that we experience with, like, the bullying and the poking fun at the, oh, like, you want to be a doctor when you grow up. Or, like, oh, you're going to be a lawyer that's, like, so Asian, right? Like, I know exactly what you mean when you talk about that and struggling with it. Um, but also we talk about kind of the individual, like more, we get into the details and the nitty gritty of it. And I'm like, actually, that's very different from the conversations that I have with my mom. Mm -hmm. Like my mom and I did not talk about George Floyd when it happened. Um, I don't think our conversations would have ended the same way that you and your, like, I don't think my mom would have walked away from those conversations with the same like ideas that your mom did. Um, mm -hmm. My mom has a very rigid understanding of like what racism is like in this country um and she did like she's not she just isn't like it's again with the immigration thing like she's just not perceptive to the way that i perceive racism in this country um mm. and it's just it's really hard to have conversations with her about stuff like that and so i just never do so like with so again like when you say your mom said that she understands more about the world because like you and your brother have kind of introduced a different aspect of it to her mm -hmm. i don't think i've had many conversations like that with my mom but i've had conversations with my mom where i'm like oh like my entire vision of like getting old and humanity and like morality and religion and marriage and like really and sex and like really personal stuff like that is the stuff that my mom and I kind of really get into um which I don't know I think that's interesting I think that's weird that's maybe it's also because like you're a boy and I'm a girl and so like the stuff that we just talk to our moms about is gonna be different than like <laughs> we're gonna bring gender into this guys no but like I don't know do you like find it interesting when I I don't know. I find it fascinating when you're like, oh, I talked to my mom about like X, Y, Z, and this is what we came out with. I'm like, that's fucking incredible. Like, I don't know. Do you ever have moments where like, I'm like, this is what my mom and I talk about. And you're like, that's fucking weird. But okay. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I feel like, I don't know. You see a lot of difference in it, but I see a lot of echoes of like the same thing. Maybe not in particular, like the, in the particular details, but like, I don't know. I like, I don't feel like the things are that different. Maybe that one conversation that we had was like a little different, but like mm -hmm. 
all the other things that you like listed like generally like like are there right mm-hmm. I, I feel like most people who like have a decent enough relationship with their parents who can talk to them can talk about things like that you know like do you know like you don't have to name them by name obviously but like <sighs> You were talking about you know kiddos, right? Which I love that you use, you're saying kiddos because I just think that's very endearing. I refer to but, myself as a kiddo too. Yeah, I mean that's me too. I yeah, <laughs> no, I get that. Um, but you know kiddos who have who have parents that are on the more like I, I'm going to use the word aggressive side of things when it comes to pressuring them into stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, do you have a horror story about that? Like, do you know somebody who's, like, gone through something with their parents where it's just like, whoa, that's kind of crazy? Because I do. I have, like, several where I'm just like, I, I think do. that constitutes, like, domestic abuse, low-key, just because, like, you, okay, well, you know. Um... <laughs> do you... I do. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's scary. It's scary. I hear It's it. also, like, really scary, like, being in the position that i am like i know a lot about like th- something that i keep wanting to talk about that i don't talk about it's like suicide rates for like asians and like our demographic or like oh yes it's it's it's, it's the number one leading killer i think for like asian americans ages 14 it's like 20 something yep right like like i know that i study it that's part of that's part of the whole like medicine thing project no not in the medicine it's part it's part of the, the podcast is part of the music like, like oh, well yeah it's, it's very <laughs> deeply integrated with like the artistic philosoph- philosophical side of my life yes probably probably should medicine too but we'll do it later, <laughs> later, later, later so it's very interesting to see um to see it kind of like start to happen right like, 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 like there, there are some times where, where where things are happening and I just want to like like it's so clear to me what's happening mm-hmm. right and it's so horrifying <laughs> that it's happening but it doesn't feel like the parents in those situations see it and i think that's like this should be a, this this actually could be like a short film horror project whatever but but there, write it down like this, we'll work on it <laughs> there's this intense there's this intense like horror of knowing where this trajectory is and watching this parents like keep beating their head against it like mm-hmm. it, okay okay i guess i'm gonna have to go into specifics because it's not gonna make sense if i don't say specifics but like <laughs> you don't have to mention anything too detailed but like yeah there, we can talk about I, it. honestly i'll go in specifics but i feel like this is a general enough experience that like you won't be able to tag anyone on it <laughs> but, but, like, but like there there is this like there's this like kiddo that i like i know who like whose parents really want them to do like the whole like medicine thing. I, I would even argue this is more being pushed than, than, than what I say of having no options. Right. Mm-hmm. This is probably more explicitly being pushed. Oh yeah. No. And like, Which this happens. kid is clear. This kid is clearly depressed. Right. Yes. Like, like and, and you know, the statistics, you know how this works. You know, that the end point of this is that you might not have this, this kid anymore. Right. Like, like, yep. like, <sighs> like they, they actually might just, just kill themselves. Yep. Right. Mm. And it's so asinine watching their parents keep just throwing the whole just study harder thing Mm -hmm. at them Mm -hmm. when you know that like the fundamental problem has to do with that Mm -hmm. right and it's it's watching a train crash in slow motion essentially Mm -hmm. right you know where this is going you know where this ends you've seen it a million times Mm -hmm. right and it's like it's it's just like this like feeling of like really strong amount of like sadness and frustration and like horror Mm -hmm. just watching it happen and yeah like that's one that's one of the it it bothers me a lot in in a lot of ways all right like you know like i I don't think that's something that we talk about enough and i really want to write a song about it (sighs) yeah i do think me and my position of where i am actually being able to have survived the pre-med system in medical school now Right, Mm -hmm. getting to accomplish a lot of what a lot of these Asian American kids can't and not having to deal with the disappointment that some of them are going to feel from themselves or their family or society puts a lot of survivor's guilt on me sometimes. Mm -hmm. Right. There 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 is a certain amount of like even though I even though I do have feelings about how like difficult this is and like how in a probably a more perfect world I wouldn't be doing this, Mm -hmm. right? There is also a part of me that's really grateful that I made it and can survive it. And knowing that other people don't, 
right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a big reason why I do a lot of the art, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah. That's so... That's very profound. I think that mm -hmm. we... As a group, when you're marginalized, you have to look death in the face a lot more often than other people do. Mm -hmm. um, whether that is brutalization, whether that's exactly what you're talking about, like people taking their own lives. It's a kind of violence that comes from... Not comes from... It's a kind of violence that a lot of people... Some people never experience. Mm-hmm because they just won't you know the idea that this is the only path like we, we were talking about right like this pros and cons list and like well you know this is the only thing that you know seems like it, it's light at the end of the tunnel for a lot of people be it is it's your entire life like it becomes your entire life and if you hate it then you hate your entire life and people aren't often confronted with like how that affects the way that people treat themselves and live and mm -hmm. treat other people and treat their fundamental existence. They, they're like, if I hate this so much, then like, why am I even here? You know? Mm -hmm. And that's just not a feeling that everybody has. I mean, I think it's more common and I think we talk about it more and it's becoming less taboo because obviously again, the internet is doing a lot to make sure that you know people are being heard people are being seen and that like things are being talked about in ways they've never been talked about before so i think the idea that these ideas are becoming less and less is like because i'm seeing it more i'm like oh well you know like we're talking about it and it's getting better but also at the same time it's happening and it's probably never going to stop happening um and having to look it in the eyes every so often is probably going to be good for you, you know? Um, with stuff like this in particular, too, I I think it's easy to say, oh, it's like society. Like, society is the thing that's fucked up. So that's why all of these bad things are happening. But I have to really introspect about stuff like that sometimes because I find myself... I, I sometimes I have thoughts and I'm like fuck that's my mom talking I find myself seeing what people choose to do with their lives sometimes and I'm like you're really gonna choose that career path okay well you know like I have Asian parent thoughts and I'm like fuck uh -huh. I'm part of the problem but like <laughs> and this ties into what I was saying earlier about how like hipsters became fucking republicans like that's so weird to me i'm like how does that happen but it's because people stop checking themselves they stop mm -hmm. having empathy for people that are going through things because they've had it so good for so long that it's like oh, i don't even, like pay attention to that thing anymore or if they do the thing again like what i was talking about earlier with my mom and immigration right where they're like they have experiences they've had these feelings before and then they start to trivialize them because they just haven't had them in a long time or it's like well like i made it so like, yeah. you know, How hard can it be? Mm -hmm. and I don't think that's like, I mean, I look at that and I'm like, that's like not a good thing to do. But then I'm like, how conscious is that? You know, I mean, it's probably not conscious much at all. Like we have to think about these things and we have to be conscious of them and we have to, we have to be aware of them and we have to be aware of what's going on around us so that it doesn't affect us and but also i don't know it's weird like do you ever feel like if you stop suffering you're gonna become a bad person <laughs> <laughs> do you ever think about that do you ever think about the people who have become better people by suffering personally for me i feel like that with art and i feel like i don't know maybe we're like going around in like these big old loopholes and shit but i do feel like all of this is connected but sometimes when i write poetry when i'm heartbroken I'm like, I could, this never would have come out of me if I didn't go through this bad thing. If I didn't go through this bad thing and I didn't go through this tragedy, I would not have been able to create this beautifully tragic thing that I can now put into something concrete that means something to me. 
And it wouldn't mean something to me if I hadn't gone through it. And it wouldn't mean anything to other people if they haven't also gone through it. You know, I think about that. I think about what kind of person I'm I'm going to be if I get that stable career that my mom always talked about having, you know, or talked about me having, you know. Hmm. Um, and I don't know, like you've, you're doing music now, right? So you're doing you're doing one of the occupations where people talk about how like, oh, like you're, you, there's no future in that. Or like, what do you, what, like, how are you going to put food on the table with that? Like you're doing that thing now. And I guess I'm wondering, like, do you ever worry that you're going to like run out of stuff to write about? <laughs> so like <laughs> earlier in like, I don't know. I, I was going to say early in my music career, but I've only been making music for like a year. Uh, <laughs> But, like, like at the beginning, I do think that was, like, a genuine concern because, like, so much of the music that I wrote was about, like, racial pain and things like that. And it's still a lot of it is. But I also have learned to free up some of that mental space and write things about things that I, like, feel strongly about negatively or positively, right? Mm -hmm. Like, 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 just writing songs about, like, positive experiences while maybe not the thing that i would particularly want to publish are things that's you know but there's still things that inspire me that i want to make right mm -hmm. maybe not maybe my artistic identity means i won't particularly publish it mm -hmm. right along with the other things but but i, I do find that i still want to like I, I i have been able to extract inspiration from things that are positive which took a while to figure out how to do but i did when it comes to suffering though the thing that like i fear yeah. the most of losing is not my artistic expression mm. but and this is probably not healthy <laughs> but it's like enough anger to motivate social change ah. right? that, that's that's probably the thing i fear the most is that once i get to the end of like the medicine thing right and like life is stable right that, that's why i keep bringing up the dissonance about like a good healthcare system being universal healthcare, meaning that i don't make as much money as I would have in this current broken system, mm -hmm. right? That's I keep needing to remind myself of it because I do have a genuine fear that if I get too comfortable later, it's going to placate me in pushing for the change that I genuinely think should be done in the future, mm -hmm. right? That's um, so good. I can't believe you just I, said that. That's incredible. There, there's this, there's this piece of critical race theory writing that i want to do at some point in my life mm -hmm. right that's about how um how the stigma of the, the the social expectations that asians do something like medicine or law becomes an inherent race becomes an inherent placating effect on the asian american communities in general it's going to require research and i think this is just a brief idea so don't take it like as like a good piece of like fully thought out stuff no i'm but following to, you though i do want to do research on it later but it's like if you like like the social expectations to push like asian americans into like these particular fields right mm -hmm. if you think about all these fields they're very like status quo invested fields things like medicine and law right yeah um engineering and things like that are one high time investment fields you have to do a lot of education in order to be able to do these things mm -hmm. right and like i said earlier anything that's high time investment necessitates that you believe in the status quo to some degree mm -hmm. right it would really suck if you get through 16 years and then have, <laughs> and then the world changes on year 17 yep right on year um, 17 fuck <laughs> yeah <laughs> and also like systematically these like careers are very deeply embedded like with status quo systems right like law in particular medicine has the whole like the whole industry insurance and things like that pharmacy very status quo uh embedded law is nothing but a status quo like yep profession right because like the law is play is predicated on the status quo right yes. like, like like the status quo makes the law yes right so by socially pushing by socially pushing uh, a racial minority it could be any but in this particular about pushing any caste right mm -hmm. into these professions right um and in america cast is like race essentially right mm -hmm. there's a really great book that i'm reading right now which makes that argument um you placate a whole political arm of of a minority of a potential minority movement right because something people don't understand is that like asians have a 
Asian Americans genuinely did have a strong radical move social movement at different points in history, right? Mm -hmm. But if you like consolidate what the expectations for Asians into these particular things that they can do, which all happen to support the status quo, right? Mm -hmm. Something interesting happens because like now these Asian American like you don't even have to like make all of them do it Mm -hmm. you just have to do it to a certain degree which a critical amount of them Mm -hmm. go into the system come out go back to their communities and become like the thought leaders of their communities Mm -hmm. right notice like in the asian american community at least my experience a lot of a lot of the asian american leaders in our community are business people law people medicine Mm -hmm. like dental dental like things like that Mm -hmm. right what happens when those are the people leading your communities it inherently placates the community, the, the 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 political action of the community as a whole. Hey, this is N in the editing booth, and I just wanted to like, I guess, hit on some things that like I kind of missed there, and uh, clarify a couple of things as well because these are like new ideas, and I think are worth discussing. And I still haven't completely figured them out myself, uh, so it's probably a good idea to revisit and think about them, especially since it's been like a couple of weeks since I recorded that thing that you just heard. Uh, one thing that, like, I kind of worry about that, uh, maybe I don't have to worry about too much, but, but I do kind of worry about a little bit in what I'm trying to say is that, like, people, like, may think that, like, I don't want Asians to become doctors. And, like, that's not really my biggest issue. My biggest issue is, is something more akin to, like, the type of, like, analysis that we've had when it comes to, like, um other minorities and like their expectations right uh one really great like one really good piece of like social understanding that i think like the black community has figured out is that like having the only method of upward mobility being tied to one thing is a problem for the black community that's going to be in like entertainment right a lot of people the only way to find upward mobility for them is to like do like music or like sports something like that um, and I see similar problems with the Asian American community when it comes to medicine. Uh, for for one, like what I talked about before, I do think it genuinely has like a placating effect on Asian American politics. For what used to be genuinely uh, a group that had very strong civil rights action, losing a lot of it because of things like this. Um, the second thing is that like tying all of a certain race's upward mobility to something in particular is going to get for for us asian americans at least i think it's a large reason why a lot of us have problems with things like suicide Uh, because it's really hard for them to push through and imagine and do things that they really want to do because the only options that they have are very limited Uh, which is why like i think I don't want to discourage any Asian American who wants to be a doctor to be a doctor. Like, if that's what you want to do, do it. Like, I I do it. Like, it's not something I'm inherently against. But I do want Asian Americans who don't want to do that to genuinely have the options to be able to live their dreams and their lives the way that they want to and have an expectation to be able to have some sort of decent standard of living that other people are afforded um, by not being minorities in America. Uh, And I guess the last thing that I really want to hit with that is um, I make kind of a criticism about having uh, doctors and like dentists and like, and like these like academics. Uh, I wouldn't really consider them academics, but like, careers that are very tied to like long stints of education um, as thought leaders in the community. Um, and I, I feel like some people on initial reaction may think that that's not a bad thing to have well-educated people uh, being the leaders of your community. And I, I don't disagree. I, I do think the leaders of your community should be people who are well-educated, but I do think that the type of education that you get for the stereotypical Asian American fields are not particularly pieces of education that are conducive to good leadership action. Uh, I I don't want to say it's a criticism because it's not really, but like doctors are educated with a very specific 
mindset on things. We solve problems in very specific ways. And in a lot of ways, we are a bit disconnected from what's really happening on the ground in the communities. I, I, like, I, I don't think you can in good faith argue that like a doctor who's making well above uh, the average income of Americans, much less Asian Americans, is going to be in a good position to understand what's happening on the ground for people who aren't doctors. Uh, no matter how like compassionate and loving you try to be, and, and, and I do know a lot of my colleagues who, who are in medicine are very compassionate and loving, there is going to inherently be some sort of disconnect between what they're doing um, what, what they're being taught, what they're doing, the community that they're surrounded themselves, and just the pure fact that like they are in a different economic class that's going to disassociate them from everyone else. And I think that inherently makes for leadership that does not serve the majority, the average American, much less Asian American well. Um, not that I'm saying like doctors should not be involved in, in, in leadership of the communities. They just should not make up a a huge portion of it um and 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 really when it comes to people who are leading the community it's got to be people who are genuinely deeply involved with it who are on the ground who know what's going on and i just don't i'm not convinced that that's something that can happen with these people who are in fields that are that are genuinely in a different class than everyone else it, it's, it's just not going to be the type of leadership that's like beneficial to everyone. It's going to be the type of leadership that's beneficial to people who are in the higher class. Um, so yeah, that's that's my addendum. Three things that I want to note. I was going to say real quick, but that probably wasn't real quick. But I do think it adds a little bit more nuance to what I'm trying to say, especially now that I've had some time to like think about it, refine. The thing about like doing the podcast is sometimes you just like say things and like you deal with that later. Um, but yeah, well, we'll get back to it. This ties fucking perfectly into the <laughs> shit that happened in the Supreme Court with fucking affirmative action. Yes. <laughs> but, yes. but like, yes. it, this is exactly what, like, it's actually fucking happening. And like, I totally support you writing that research paper because I am fascinated about this. And I think it's like a topic that's very fucking important. But like, mm -hmm. you are completely right in saying that getting a whole you said arm it's a basically a fucking leg at this point i mean there's so <laughs> many of us here right in mm -hmm. america at this point now um especially if you include like all groups of asian people right i know a lot of people, uh, still there are a lot of people nowadays that are like asian and then they think just you know southeast asian or south south east eastern asian eastern, eastern asian. asian we're yeah. eastern asians east that's the direction. Well, I guess Vietnam is technically southeast, but east in general. Okay, yeah, yes. like east in yes. general. Like, a lot of people still think it's that, but, like, if you combine all of us, there's a shit ton of us here. And if, like, you could do that, I bet, because we're technically all part of the same fucking ethnic group. But, like, no. No. It's not happening. And mm -hmm. the we talked about model minority and stuff, too on the podcast before but that's also another facet of it right is like separating us from the people who you know the other people who are suffering more mm -hmm. so that we can be more white what is going on like what <laughs> what is the appeal of that and you're so right in saying that the lack of suffering and adhering to the status quo and just being comfortable is enough to placate people into not fighting for things because mm -hmm. that's true like the fight that you get when you look at injustice comes from a survival instinct that it just isn't there when you're comfortable yeah that's so, why all like the the most like powerful movements of change always come from like always come from like people who who have the most to lose who are suffering the most right because that that that's what that's what they have the direct motivation for it right yep and i think as part of being in a position which i do think there's a lot more privilege i will admit that like it means that i need to like consciously keep in mind that like my stability isn't the reality of like everyone's right Yep. and that there's still things worth fighting for you know because like 
Because there, because there is, you know? <laughs> there are definitely still things worth fighting for. Has, has, med, has med school been something worth fighting for, though? Are you really enjoying it? I I genuinely find the material, like, <laughs> really fun. As difficult as it can... Like, like I said earlier, the highs are really high and the lows are, like, really low. Like, I don't think I've ever, like, doubted myself as much before. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, like, the victories, like, like, like... The victories feel hard, harder, <laughs> right? Um, but that, I mean, I feel like they would feel more earned that way too, though. Like the harder mm-hmm. a victory, the more you're like, "Oh fuck, I did that! Damn, I'm cool." Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like. It's 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 a balancing act. You don't want it to get to your head either, but like, <laughs> there there. But I also do think there there's a certain amount of like, just in order to survive it, you have to like be impressed with yourself to some degree oh i mean yeah and also you're if there's anybody who should be impressed with themselves it's definitely you i just want everybody to know that i don't really do anything for this podcast i i come i come in and i sit down in front of a mic and in front of a camera with my little computer and i just talk like on is the one who does all of the actual fucking heavy lifting for this and i just reap the benefits with absolutely zero work and he's doing all of this on top of like being in med school i should probably do more um <laughs> she does the social media so. barely though like so i know literally if you barely, don't see us on social media it's it's, it's, it's my fault no yeah <laughs> but i mean like i i don't know i think that you are a genuinely incredible person and if somebody deserves to celebrate their victories, it's definitely you. And like, I I don't know. I think this all culminates into like, our parents came from a place of like love and they pressured us into being the best versions of ourselves that we could be. And I think whatever form that takes, as long as you are being true to yourself and what you are doing and you do genuinely love it, like I don't think any parent could ask for more from like for their children, you know? So yeah. whatever that might be, like do that, you know? It means making art with Yeji instead of me. Okay, well, you know, we're I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I'm teaching myself instruments again. That's what I'm doing. That's where I'm starting. We'll get there. Now we're getting We got there. a couple years in order to figure it out, you know. And then New York. And then New York. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that is how I look at a lot of this. It's like I like I'm viewing like med school as like a time to learn, right? Not just to learn medicine for the career, but also as a time to like you know, by the time we I don't want to get I don't want to be at the point in which finally I have enough money to actually be able to authentically engage with the art and like fund things the way I want to mm-hmm. but not have the skills for it. Mm-hmm. Right? So I genuinely am looking at these like next 4ish years as like the opportunity to just like try things artistically, push myself, learn new things in order that by the time when we have the opportunity to do things that like we can we, we can do it <laughs> right yeah I don't, I don't want the lack of skill to be the thing that stops when we have the money <laughs> <laughs> that would really suck that would really suck i can do this now oh but you know you're fucking broke <laughs> god <laughs> damn it or you're not broke when you don't have the skills for it Ugh. what an awful existence <laughs> This podcast was produced by Yeji. It was created and written by both of us. It was edited by me. The cover art was done by my good friend, Emma Nebecker. And the background art for the videos were done by my good friend, Penelope Moreno.